Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Overcoming COVID-19, a Historical Perspective. Um, welcome, everyone. I see more and more still joining us, which is great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you to all the groups and organizations who helped to make this happen and who supported this webinar presentation. So uh, my name is Stefan Ramdor. I'm a member of the Grassroots Group Medicare for All Connecticut. Several Medicare for All activists from Connecticut will guide through this webinar. And Medicare for All Connecticut is an all-volunteer grassroots group advocating for guaranteed health care to all US residents by implementing a Medicare for All single payer program. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Kenneth Engelhardt for an engaging and enlightening webinar presentation. This presentation will be followed by an open Q&A forum. At any point of time during the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A and chat function at the bottom of your screen to type in any questions or comments you might have so that they can be discussed after the presentation as part of the Q&A. In case you have not used Zoom before by clicking on the chat symbol on the bottom of your screen in the center, uh, it's possible to access the chat and to type in questions and comments. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kenneth Engelhardt. So Dr. Engelhardt is chair of Physicians for a National Health Program, Minnesota. He is also a board member of Healthcare for All Minnesota. Dr. Engelhardt is a retired internal medicine physician with 26 years of practice in the private sector and 10 years at the Minneapolis VA Medical Center. In addition, he acted as the clinical chief of general internal medicine section at Minneapolis VA, supervising 40 primary care providers and clinic operations. So Dr. Engelhardt, thank you so much for giving this presentation tonight. Um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Stefan. It's an honor and a privilege to be asked to give this presentation uh, to you all. Um, just so that people know what the presentation will be about, it's, it'll be about 60 minutes. And first I'll talk about pandemics, and then I'll talk about the countries that have been successful in managing um, COVID-19 pandemic. I'll go into some detail about the United States response uh, to this pandemic we have in our country. And then finally, I will talk about how a single payer Medicare for all system would do much better in how we do manage pandemics. So uh, what I'd like to do now is just start the PowerPoint by going to screen share. Uh, so here we are. Okay. Um, is everything okay from what you see, Stefan? Yes, looks good. Okay, okay. And we'll go ahead uh, like so. Okay, um, so the title of the talk is listed there. And Stefan introduced me already. Um, so the first uh, slide talks about how important it is to um, learn from the past. It's behind us, but it's so important, especially with pandemics, to learn from past pandemics. And that learning experience helps us to prepare for the future that lies ahead of us. And it's so important to live every day uh, and make the most out of every day. Now, when I talk about pandemics, I'll be talking primarily about viral pandemics. Uh, and that's what COVID-19 is, of course. But before I do that, I should tell you all about the greatest pandemic of all time, which is the Black Death. It's the most, it was the most devastating pandemic in human history. It peaked in Europe in the mid 1300s and it caused 75 to 200 million deaths in Europe and Asia, a mortality rate of 30 to 60% of the European population. It started in Asia and then it uh, migrated to uh, Crimea in the Black Sea area, and then finally over to Italy and the rest of Europe. And um, it, I liken this to a hitchhiker's disease, basically, and I'll explain why. Um, but what you see there is that green bug on your screen is the Yersinia pestis bacterium. And that's what caused the Black Death, that bacterium. And the reason why I say it's a hitchhiker's disease is that Yersinia pe uh, pestis uh, caught a ride on fleas, which caught a ride on black rats, 
which caught a ride on ships. And that's how it spread throughout Europe and Asia. Now what happens is this Yersinia pestis bacteria chokes off the gut of fleas, making the fleas quite irritable and causing them to bite. And so as they bit humans uh, throughout Europe and Asia, those bites transmitted the Yersinia pestis bacteria. As a result of the Black Death, major societal changes happened. Food prices went down and land values decreased by 30 to 40 percent. So if you were an ordinary person, not a lord in the feudal times, but just an ordinary person, and you were able to survive the Black Death, it was a windfall for you really because you could get land uh, at a 30 to 40 percent discount, food went down, and it really changed things for ordinary people living in those times. And actually, uh, the Black Death was the end of the feudal system. So this slide shows us past viral pandemics. And I'd like to have you look first at the bottom of the slide, bottom left. The typical flu season causes 400,000 deaths uh, worldwide. And the main point uh, from this slide is that flu pandemics or in viral pandemics are not at all unusual. Look what happened here. We had the Asian flu in the late 1950s causing from 1.5 to 2.4 million deaths. Then a decade later, we had another pandemic, the Hong Kong flu, and you can see the deaths caused there. Another decade later, we had the Russian flu, and it caused 700,000 deaths. So pandemics, viral pandemics, are not unusual. And that's the takeaway from this slide. Now, I'll primarily be talking about the Spanish flu that occurred from 1918 all the way through uh, 1920. Three full years of that Spanish flu pandemic happened. And you can see the three estimate studies here of how many deaths it caused, anywhere from 17.4 million deaths all the way up to 100 million deaths from this um, influenza uh, pandemic. This slide just is a quite a graphic presentation of how easy it is to uh, have people get infected because when an infected person sneezes or coughs, more than half a million virus particles can spread to those nearby. The Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 through 1920 was named the Spanish flu because the country of Spain was neutral in World War I, and so their press could freely write about it, uh, whereas the countries that were involved in World War I were reluctant to have any publication of the fact that they had Spanish flu going on in their country because it would make them look weak in World War I and decrease the morale of the country. So because Spain could freely write about it being a neutral country, that's how it seemed that Spain had a lot of cases of uh, the Spanish flu and, uh, and that's how it got its name, Spanish flu. That particular viral pandemic killed more people in 24 weeks than HIV AIDS did in 24 years. Now I mentioned earlier that the average number of deaths from influenza per year is 1400, or I'm sorry, is 400,000 worldwide, but the Spanish flu caused a death range of 17.4 to 100 million. It was a mortality rate of one to 6% of the world's population. And Roser writes, Influenza pandemics are not rare, but the Spanish flu of 1918 was by far the most devastating influenza pandemic in recorded history. This is a picture of an emergency hospital set up uh, to uh, take care of military personnel from Fort Riley, Kansas. And you can see they've filled the entire facility with hospital beds to take care of all the people who were infected. Even the president of the United States at the time, Woodrow Wilson, was infected with the Spanish flu. And I like this quote uh, from Woodrow Wilson that states, I not only use all the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. And I think that's important for the leader of our country to have the humility to say, I don't have all the answers and I need to rely on the expertise of others. This slide shows the three waves of the Spanish flu. 
And as I mentioned before, it lasted for three full years from the beginning of 1918 to the end of 1920. And as you see on the slide, the middle wave was the most lethal one. And that's because the H1N1 virus right in this time period uh, before the second wave mutated to a more virulent type of um, flu and uh, caused more mortality as a result of that mutation. The Spanish flu was likely the last time in history when the world population was declining. It was devastating because young people accounted for a large share of the population and a large share of the deaths. Infants and young people were most at jeopardy and nearly 50% of the deaths were ages 20 to 40. Now you might ask at this point, why did that happen? You know, usually uh, flu affects the elderly and frail people primarily. So why did the Spanish flu affect young people and even infants uh, more than the elderly? Well, the reason for that is that those who were 60 to 70 years old at the time had already experienced a type of flu, the Russian flu, in the late 1800s, and that flu was caused by the same H1N1 virus that caused the Spanish flu uh, from 1918 through 1920. So as a result of those people who were 60 to 70 years old in the Spanish flu, the result was they had developed immunity from that earlier Russian flu, and their mortality, really their life expectancy was not changed a bit when Spanish flu uh, devastated so many countries in the world. Now that Russian flu that they had uh, developed immunity from uh, had a mortality rate of 1 million people worldwide. In the Spanish flu, the majority of deaths were from secondary bacterial pneumonia caused by the bacteria we all have in our upper respiratory tract. And the reason for that is um, in 1918, we didn't have any antibiotics yet developed. The first antibiotic was not developed until 1928. So when those bacteria moved down into the weakened lungs, of people with Spanish flu, um, uh, bacterial pneumonia set in and deaths occurred. Like the Black Plague, the Spanish flu affected world history. You know, the Black Plague ended the feudal system, but um, the Spanish flu had an effect on World War I. The central powers of Germany and Austria were hit earlier and had a higher morbidity and mortality rate than the Allied powers of Britain and France, and, and, and therefore, since the Central Powers were affected earlier uh, and had a higher morbidity and mortality, it had an outcome um, effect on World War I. Now, as long as we're talking about life expectancy from past, past uh, pandemics, I think it's worthwhile looking at life expectancy at this time. And you see a whole bunch of colored lines here, and they correspond to the uh, colors here. Uh, so for example, the United States is the red line right here. The little country of Georgia is the blue line here. And then these other countries um, correlate to lines up here. Um, what I'd like to point out to you that is that all of these countries listed, with the exception of the United States, have universal health care. The United States is the only country that does not have universal health care. And we see that our life expectancy is lower than all of these other countries above us. Now, these countries that have universal health care, for the most part, have single payer universal health care. The only ones that don't really have a single payer system are Singapore and Germany. So the takeaway is countries that are able to provide health care to their citizens have a better life expectancy to the United States, which has a chaotic um, healthcare system, if we can even call it a healthcare system. Other countries with universal healthcare, particularly single payer healthcare, do better than the United States as far as life expectancy is concerned. So in comparing COVID-19, you see an example, a microscopic image of the virus there, and below it is the H1N1 uh, virus, that caused the Spanish flu, two different types of viruses. Um, the COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus and Spanish flu, the bottom picture, was caused by H1N1 virus. Now, 
coronavirus is typical of other viral infections uh, in that it's more lethal in the elderly than in infants and adults less than 50 years of age. One difference from the time of 1918 to now is that uh, we have planes that can transport infections throughout the world so rapidly. Whereas in 1918, um, travel was by railroads and steamships, so infections didn't spread quite as quickly. But another difference is that we have antibiotics now. In 1918, as I mentioned, there were no antibiotics because penicillin was first discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. Another difference between what COVID-19 uh, conditions are compared to those conditions in 1918 is that we have better nutrition than in 1918. Uh, there's less overcrowding, we have better sanitation and better hygiene. And also remember in 1918, it was the end of World War I, so uh, much of the world population was uh, weakened and resources were depleted as a result of World War I. So the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1920 has been cited as a warning and a motivation to prepare well for large pandemic outbreaks, which have been considered likely by many researchers. And we're seeing living evidence right now that these pandemics do come around, that they are not rare and we do need to be prepared for them. So what lessons have we learned so far from this COVID-19 pandemic? What have successful countries done? And uh, as I go through the countries that have been successful, you'll see several of these lessons um, demonstrated by what these countries have done. So first of all, we have to be prepared. We also have to act quickly. We have to test, trace, and quarantine, use data and technology, be aggressive, and get the private sector involved as well as the public sector. Act preventatively, use tech but respect privacy. You can do drive-through testing, learn from the past, test more as restrictions are eased, and build capacity at hospitals for potential surges. Now, Dr. Tom Frieden was a former director of the CDC, and he has this very simple, uh, easy to understand approach on how to manage a pandemic. It's called box it in. First, you have to test, and that's been a problem uh, in this country uh, ever since we learned about this pandemic. We have not had adequate testing capabilities, and we still don't have adequate testing capabilities. And some people call this the original sin of the problems we're currently seeing in this country. So testing is step number one, isolation step number two, step three is finding or contact tracing, and then four is quarantining. So if you see uh, this, this uh, lower right-hand portion, test widely. We need to know who's infected, because if we know that, then we know who to uh, isolate so that they don't go on to infect other people. And finding out who had contact with the infected person is so important too. That's called contact tracing because if you know who's been in contact with an infected individual, you can quarantine those folks for 14 days so they don't go on to infect other people. But testing and knowing is so important and that's been a huge deficiency that we've had in the United States uh, ever since the beginning of this pandemic. So here is a slide of total confirmed COVID-19 cases. And these are the countries that have been successful in the lower right hand portion. I'll be talking about those countries. And you see the United States here. We have over 1.7 million cases in the United uh, States uh, of COVID-19 compared to the much lower rates of these successful countries. And again, most of these are uh, single payer and all of them are universal healthcare. And this slide shows the total confirmed COVID-19 deaths. We passed a very grim milestone in this country today where over 100,000 deaths from COVID-19 have occurred in the United States. And so to put that in perspective for the state of Connecticut, it's like your fifth largest city, Waterbury, um, the entire population almost of Waterbury uh, being in eliminated by COVID-19 deaths. That's how many have occurred. Um, so yeah, over 100,000 deaths from COVID-19 in the United States, the most of any country in the world. 
So let's talk about Singapore. What did they do right? Well, first of all, Singapore is a highly rated healthcare system. It was rated number two by The Economist magazine. And in 2019, uh, Singapore had the world's longest life expectancy of nearly 85 years. It's largely a government-run universal healthcare system, but it's got a very complex financing mechanism of direct government subsidies, compulsory savings, national health insurance, and cost sharing. Singapore is unique in that it's a small, rich island nation, really without a hinterland or without rural areas. The other unique feature about Singapore, it's been ruled by one political party for nearly 55 years since it gained independence. And in Singapore, the local media basically carry the government's measures and message without any question at all. And there's something unique about the Asian culture as well, where Asians are more willing to place community and society needs over individual liberty, which can be very helpful in a public health crisis. Singapore is a very difficult system to replicate, however, and it probably would be impossible because of the many unique features of Singapore for other countries to replicate the Singapore healthcare system. And this conclusion was from Towers Watson, a global consulting firm. Singapore started aggressive sustained early measures with draconian tracing and containment measures. Uh, and they had a small population that was largely accepting of what the government ordered. They were one of the first places to ban incoming flights from Wuhan. Um, and also they had a mandatory quarantine for people who were coming in from uh, COVID-19 uh, countries. They also instituted travel restrictions if people, uh, Singapore citizens had recently traveled to China or parts of South Korea. They implemented strict hospital and quarantine regimens for potentially infected people with twice daily uh, temperature recordings. They did extensive contact tracing. Mass gatherings were canceled, but schools were left open but students going to school had their temperature taken when they entered to make sure that they didn't have COVID-19. And at the start of class, a photo would be taken of the students so that if one of the students was found to be infected um, after that class, um, that photo would show what other students were in nearby uh, proximity to the student who was infected. So contract uh, helped contact tracing. And Singapore quickly developed a serology test for blood antibodies for use in late February. Taiwan um, is a country 100 miles from mainland China. They've had a very uh, conflicted uh, relationship with China, a lot of difficulties with China, and they don't trust China. Um, so anything that comes out of China is suspect to the people of Taiwan. Taiwan has 24 million people. They had their first COVID-19 case on January 21st, but even before that, the day before, they activated their Central Epidemic Command Center. At the end of January, they had the second highest number of cases in the world, but they sprang into action quickly as soon as a mysterious illness in Wuhan was reported. They did widespread testing. Um, they had inspection of travelers from Wuhan starting December 31st of 2019. They had a self-quarantine tracking system and ramped up production of medical equipment as early as January of this year. They didn't have severe restrictions, however. They didn't have lockdowns uh, or school or nursery clo uh, closures. They had the other measures that I've already mentioned that uh, made them a successful country. South Korea is considered the model of poster child of how a country should manage a pandemic. They have a population of 51 million people and they have a memory of the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, MERS from 2015. So they recently had to deal with a pandemic. And South Korea had one of the larger initial outbreaks outside of China, that as of today, they've only had 269 deaths and just a little over 11,000 cases. They were also able to slow the spread of COVID-19 without lockdowns. How did they do it? Well, they had free mass diagnostic testing. Uh, 20,000 people being tested a day at over 500 screening clinics and hundreds of drive through booths. They have government websites and mobile apps that showed how many people were tested and where, and they followed the WHO recommendation of isolation and widespread contact tracing to break chains of transmission. So in Foreign Policy Magazine, the journalist wrote, South Korea is showing how this model ultimately pays off in reducing spread, taking pressure off health services, 
and keeping its death rate one of the lowest in the world. This particular slide shows the deaths in South Korea and the United States and the unemployment uh, rate in both countries. So we see here on January 21st, both countries had their first confirmed case of COVID-19 and both had roughly a similar unemployment rate. The United States 3.6 unemployed, Korea 4%. On March 3rd, the United States had nine deaths. Actually at that time, South Korea had more deaths than we did at 28. And the unemployment rates were about the same, 4.4% for the United States, 3.8% for South Korea. But look what happened. Uh, the United States delayed, minimized COVID-19, did not act, did not test properly. And by May 11th, we had 81, over 81,000 deaths in an unemployment rate of 14.7%. But because of the measures South Korea implemented on May 11th, only 256 deaths and their unemployment rate was unchanged at 4%, same as when their first confirmed co case of COVID-19 was diagnosed. And here's what South Korea did. They did testing, widespread testing and contact tracing. They did social distancing and they had a healthcare system that was prepared to handle a pandemic. Denmark, they had a very quick response also and they enlisted the help of future doctors and nurses uh, to help out with the pandemic. They had widespread testing, even drive-through testing for anyone who just simply had common cold symptoms. They, like the United States, had problems with their testing kits early on, but Denmark was quite innovative. The authorities there circulated the chemical formula for testing across the country so each lab could formulate the test and they overcame that initial delay. Denmark passed emergency legislation that was considered by some Danish people to be the most extensive since World War II. This testing, there, I'm sorry, this legislation uh, where authorities were given sweeping powers for mandated testing, quarantining, and to give vaccines when they became available was uh, passed by the Denmark legislature as an emergency les legislation. And the head of the University of Copenhagen Medical School said, we have a direct line of communication from the national government to the regional government to hospital directors. So they have a much clearer chain of command um, than we've seen in our country. Georgia, it's a small country and the reason I mention it is that it kind of snuck under the, the radar. Georgia is the most recent country with a single payer system. They enacted single payer healthcare in the little country of Georgia with a struggling economy in 2013. So they've been able to do it. Um, and at the end of February, 2020, they had school closures and they were able to do widespread diagnostic testing. And so uh, a, George, a Georgian journalist from that little country gave such a humble explanation for why they were successful stating, I think the fact that the government took it seriously from the very start has helped. Iceland, they tested more people per capita than anywhere in the world and at one time had the highest per capita infection rate. Iceland is a good example of private public cooperation because their testing was uh, developed by a private medical research company in Reykjavik, it's called De Decode Genetics, who coordinated with the public National University Hospital of Iceland. They had a meticulous and quick response in Iceland and aggressive testing and contract tracing. So on March 6th, Iceland declared a state of emergency when only two community cases of COVID-19 were confirmed. Three days later, they implemented a 14-day quarantine for all Icelanders entering the country. Universities were closed, but not schools and nurseries, and this allowed parents to continue working. And an Iceland journalist uh, stated, our growth has not actually become exponential due to these early measures of quarantining people who have likely been exposed to the virus. Germany, Germany has a very impressive healthcare infrastructure. It's amazing, really. They have three times the number of ICUs than Spain does. And Germany has more spare ICU beds than all of Italy's ICU beds. Germany had a projected uh, peak need of 12,000 beds when the surge occurred. 
but the country actually has 147,000 beds, so they're well prepared for a surge. They have such a large capacity in Germany that they're actually taking coronavirus patient, patients from Italy, Spain, and France. Their private public cooperation for testing uh, has allowed Germany to test 100,000 people a day. They have enough ventilators to meet unforeseen demand. Their leaders have endeavored to improve care in recent years. Now, Germany had high infection rates, but rather low death rates. And the reason that is felt to be is that these high infection rates happened in young people that were returning from ski trips to Italy and Austria. And so although they were uh, infected, um, they were young. And as mentioned with coronavirus, the death rates happened more in the elderly and frail populations. And Germany has recently um, begun to open their country up again, and they've done more testing as the lockdown uh, was scaled back. And finally, our country to the north, Canada, they have more expansive testing than we had and continue to have. Their infrastructure for testing and contact tracing was established earlier in January and February. And they remember SARS, um, severe acute respiratory syndrome that affected Canada in 2003, such that Canada was the only country outside of Asia to have deaths from SARS. Canada has a well-funded public health system and the criteria for COVID-19 testing was not as limited as the United States. So Justin Ling wrote in Foreign Policy that Canada has spent the last two decades preparing for this moment. By catching cases early and investigating their origins, Canada has blunted the impact of the virus thus far. So now this leads us to the United States response. And to be honest, um, the United States response has really been disastrous. The fact that we have more deaths than any other country in the world and have more coronavirus cases than any other country in the world is not something to be proud of and we could have done so much better. So I'm gonna spend some time talking uh, about a timeline for the United States because we need to learn what we've done wrong. Uh, we need to learn from the past so that we can make corrections and prepare better for the future. Most of what I'm gonna talk about is from a New York Times article entitled, He Could Have Seen What Was Coming Behind Trump's Failure on the Virus. This is a picture of um, former President uh, Barack Obama, who delivered a speech to the NIH in 2014. And in that speech, he stated, we have to be aware of a time when there will be an airborne disease that is deadly, and we have to put in place an infrastructure. And what is written in red at the bottom of this uh, lower right part of the slide is just such a prescient quote from President Obama, where he states that, so that if and when a new strain of flu, like the Spanish flu, crops up five years from now, or a decade from now, we've made the investment and we're further along to be able to catch it. That was stated in 2014, and he stated five years as a possible time frame, and here we are, a little over five years later, and we are de dealing with a pandemic. So, if you remember, back in the Obama administration, they had to deal with Ebola. And um, because of that experience with the Ebola epidemic, in 2016, the Obama administration developed the National Security Council Directorate for Global Health Security and Biodefense. Kind of a long name, but their purpose was to prepare for the next disease outbreak and prevent it from becoming an epidemic or pandemic. So, a senior director of that directorate, Beth Cameron, stated, in a health security crisis, speed is essential. So what happened to this directorate? Well, in 2018, it was dissolved under the Trump administration. So Beth Cameron, who was the former senior director of that directorate, stated, when President Trump took office in 2017, the White House's National Security Council Directorate for Global Health Security and Biodefense survived the transition intact. One year later, I was mystified when the White House dissolved the office, leaving the country less prepared for pandemics like COVID-19. 
From January to August 2019, this is last year, the uh, folks from Health and Human Services conducted a war game that they called the Crimson Contagion. And it postulated that there was a, a SARS-like infection that started in China and spread rapidly throughout the world. And the first case in the United States uh, occurred in Chicago. And that the infection was spreading rapidly from people traveling on planes. And these people were sick with high fevers. So this war game exercise that lasted a great deal of the year of 2019 predicted 110 million, uh, 110 million infections, 7.7 .7 million hospitalizations, 586,000 deaths, and they reported their, they published their report in October 2019. So they didn't keep it a secret, they released it and published it. Two months later, in December of 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases of unknown cause was discovered in China. It was felt that the source of that, uh, those pneumonia cases was the Hunan seafood wholesale market. And it was felt that the infection was of zoonotic origin. That means transmitted from animals. So just to explain, the Hunan seafood wholesale market is a, these, these wet markets um, are rather nasty. Um, live animals are kept in cages, stacked one on top of the other. And um, they're quite filthy places too, because uh, there can be blood on the ground. Um, animals can just be simply gutted right on the spot. There can be urine, excrement on the ground. They're, they're not very sanitary places. And what was felt to have happened was that COVID-19 started in bats. And there's many species, species of bats in China and bats can carry a number of viruses. So it was felt that a bat was the original source of COVID-19. This bat infected some animal uh, that was trans transferred to the Hunan uh, seafood market and that animal passed COVID-19 onto humans. So it jumped from bats to some animal in the seafood market and from that animal to humans. Uh, these pneumonia cases were reported to the WHO at the end of December, but even the day before that, there was an email from a Health and Human Services attache in Beijing, China, sent back to the United States saying, there's something bad going on here in China with pneumonia cases. In fact, um, the NSC received intelligence reports predicting spread to the USA within weeks, and it was going to be like the 2003 SARS infection. Matthew Pottinger, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor, had a friend in Hong Kong who's an epidemiologist. This friend called Matthew Pottinger to warn him about a bad infection happening that was like 2003 SARS. So we knew at the end of January and even early, uh, rather we knew in early January that something bad was brewing in, in China. But in the United States, Lawrence Kudlow and Stephen Mnuchin uh, we're worried that if we talk too much about it, it would have bad economic repercussions in the United States. So while we did nothing really about it in January, there were 14,000 travelers a day from China entering the U.S. Now, the first confirmed case in the United States was a traveler from Wuhan to Seattle in mid-January. Remember that time frame, mid-January. On January 17th, the World Health Organization uh, provided testing instructions to anybody in the world. Uh, these instructions were from a German researcher uh, on how to develop test kits for COVID-19, but the CDC opted not to accept those test kits from the WHO. On February 5th, the WHO shipped 250,000 test kits to more than 70 labs worldwide, and at that point we realized that the CDC test kits were flawed and had to be remanufactured. This was a, a huge early mistake early on, and it delayed widespread testing. Another big mistake we made early on in the United States is we minimized the disease. So this is from a, a CNBC transcript where Joe Kernan was interviewing President Trump at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And Kernan asked Trump, are there worries about a pandemic at this point? And President Trump said, no, not at all and were 
we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China and we have it under control. It's going to be just fine. So there's a group of people in this country, they're infectious disease experts uh, in government and at universities, and they developed this Red Dawn group named after a, a movie in the 1980s when the United States was infected by a foreign uh, country. And in response to that invasion, um, a Red Dawn group uh, was banded together to return um, the country to the people of the United States. So this Red Dawn group um, includes Dr. James Lawler. Uh, he's an infectious disease doctor at the University of Nebraska. And he really was upset by the minimization of the seriousness of COVID-19. So he said, um, great understatements in history is what he tweeted. Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, just a little stroll gone bad. Um, Pompeii, a bit of a dust storm from the volcano that buried Pompeii. Hiroshima, a bad summer heat wave. And Wuhan, just a bad flu season is what we were told. And we were told that in April uh, last month that the virus would be gone. On January 20th, uh, the first COVID-19 case was diagnosed in South Korea. And the NSC in the United States said, we better get ready uh, to consider quarantining for a city the size of Chicago. On January 30th, we had our first confirmed person-to-person -person transmission in the United States. And at that time, the WHO stated that we have a global public health emergency. On February 2nd, um, the China ban uh, was in implemented uh, in our country, uh, which was the right thing to do. Um, foreign nationals with a recent China visit were barred from entering the United States. The problem is it was done about a month too late. On February 21st, the Coronavirus Task Force was convened and they went back to that crimson contagion exercise that they had done in the summer before in 2019. Only this time it was a real-time version of crimson contagion dealing with what was going on in the United States with COVID-19. And their conclusion was we need to move to aggressive social distancing. So at the end of February, public health experts, including Dr. Fauci, from the NIH, Dr. Redfield, the head of the CDC, and uh, Alexander Azar of Health and Human Services gathered, and they presented a document named the Four Steps to Mitigation uh, to Trump. But Trump basically ignored that uh, advice, instead focusing on messaging and confident predictions that we'd be successful in the United States. And when he did that, uh, the United States squandered vital time as the coronavirus silently spread across the country. And we see there on February 26th, about the time that the four steps to mitigation was presented to Trump, we had 15 cases of COVID-19. About three weeks later, we had gone to 4, 000, over 4,000 cases. On March 1st, the Health and Human Services announced that they were gonna have an investigation as to what went wrong with our test kits. On March 11th, Trump announced travel restrictions from Europe. On March 13th, he stated he was not responsible for COVID-19 testing problems in the United States. So the person who's responsible for the safety and security of United States citizens declared he was not responsible for the testing problems we were having. On March 16th, finally on March 16th, Trump announced social distancing to last only two weeks. On March 17th, coronavirus had developed in all 50 of the United States. And on March 18th, the coronavirus relief package was signed by Trump. And this offered free testing, not treatment, just free testing for COVID-19. Now keep in mind that the first case entering the United States from China into Seattle happened in mid-January. So here it is, two months later, it takes an act of Congress for us to be able to test people in the United States for COVID-19. It's, it's just totally unacceptable to have a two month delay when you're trying to reduce the risk of spread. And we've seen what's happened as a result of that in our, in our country. So another thing that happened as Lee Fang wrote in The Intercept, while much of the world moves swiftly to lock down crucial medical supplies used to treat the coronavirus, 
the U.S. dithered, maintaining business as usual and allowing large shipments of American-made respirators and ventilators to be sold to foreign buyers. So we were selling N95 masks and ventilators in March, when, and we've experienced a shortage of them. It, it makes no sense to be selling these to foreign countries when we need them in our own country. March 26th, that was the day when we became the country with the most infections than anywhere in the world. On April 11th, we became the country with the most COVID-19 deaths than anywhere in the world. So what does Trump do in response to having the most deaths and infections than any other country in the world? Well, on April 14th, he decided we should stop payments to the World Health Organization, an organization that manages uh, and assists with pandemics throughout the world. And a week after that, he basically fired Dr. Rick Bright, uh, who is the director of the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority. He had been in that position since 2016, but he was abruptly dismissed uh, from leading the development of a vaccine. And that's what Dr. Bright had done for his entire career has worked on vaccines. But it was because he had a dispute with Trump over hydroxychloroquine. Dr. Bright wanted that drug rigorously studied to see if it actually was beneficial for COVID-19. But Donald Trump uh, promoted it as uh, a cure for the disease. And um, we've since learned in a recent Lancet article that patients with COVID-19 who are treated with hydroxychloroquine have a significantly higher risk of death when they take that drug. And there has been no actual benefit uh, in COVID-19 patients who have received uh, hydroxychloroquine. But because of that dispute, you know, Dr. Rick Bright was fired as the director of BARDA. And he wrote in the New York Times, sidelining me in the middle of this pandemic and placing politics and cronyism ahead of science put, puts lives at risk and stunts national efforts to safely and effectively address this urgent public health crisis. On April 28th, we had more coronavirus deaths than those of the entire Vietnam War. On April 29th, another error, the United States withdrew funding from EcoHealth Alliance, which works in China to study bats and learn what potential future uh, viral infections can come from bats, including coronavirus, but we withdrew funding from that group, uh, handicapping us from knowing what's coming in future infections. So as of today, uh, U.S. coronavirus deaths as of this morning were over 99,000. Uh, uh, Actually, over the course of today, we've exceeded 100,000 deaths. We're at 29% of the world total deaths from coronavirus. And we have 1.7 million cases of coronavirus, which is 30% of the world total. So we are a country with 4.3% of the world population but we have 29% of the coronavirus deaths in the world and 30% of coronavirus cases. So the conclusion of that New York Times article was, the chaotic culture of the Trump White House contributed to this crisis. A lack of planning and a failure to execute combined with the president's focus on the news cycle and his preference for following his gut rather than the data cost time and perhaps lives. A recent study, a uh, modeling study from Columbia University shows what would have happened if we had implemented the lockdown one week earlier than we did in March and two weeks earlier than we did in March. So the number of deaths, um, 65,000 on May 3rd, uh, and that was when uh, the lockdown happened on March 16th, so that's the time frame. But they said, okay, how many deaths would have happened if we had done it a week earlier than March 16th? Well, um, we would have saved about 35,000 lives. And how about if we implemented the lockdown two weeks earlier? Well, it would have saved about 54,000 lives. So this delay that happened in the United States cost lives. Now we've opened up the country again. On April 17th, um, there was an Opening Up America Again document uh, developed by the CDC and they had gating criteria for how we were supposed to open up the country. And one of their gating criteria was a downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14-day period. So um, on April 29th, 
the Trump administration rejected that report from the CDC entitled Guidance for Implementing the Opening Up of America Again Framework. And the CDC basically was told that that document would not see the light of day. So this is a, a graph of that 14 day period before the country was opened up roughly May 7th. And as you can see, there is no downward trajectory really of, of this um, slide with new cases. And if you look at how many cases occurred on each of these days, with the exception of this day, which had over 40,000 new cases, all the other ones have 20 to 29,000 new cases a day without a downward trajectory. But nevertheless, the country was opened up against CDC guidelines. So what is it like if you're a patient um, in a time of a pandemic? Well, 45% of Americans have nothing in their savings account, according to a Go Banking Rate survey done in 2019. Another 24% have less than $1,000, and 51% of Americans avoid medical care due to inability to pay. So if you're an American that has nothing in their savings account and you're not sure if, you if your insurance company is going to pay for a COVID-19 test or you uh, don't have any insurance at all and you're sick with a fever, are you going to go get a COVID-19 test done? It's highly unlikely if you have nothing in your savings account or even less than $1,000. And that person not going to get tested hinders uh, the containment of uh, the virus causing the pandemic throughout our country. The Washington Post, Amy Goldstein, uh, st the title of her article was, first the coronavirus pandemic took their jobs, then it wiped out their health insurance. And she stated, in a nation where most health coverage is hinged, hinged to employment, the economy's vanishing jobs are wiping out insurance in the midst of a pandemic. On May 7th, over 33 million Americans had filed for unemployment. Since then, we've learned that uh, since mid-March, over 38 million Americans have filed for unemployment. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Urban Institute estimated as many as 43 million people in our country are expected to lose health insurance due to this pandemic. So that's the impact on patients. How about the impact on healthcare workers? This is Derek Smith, who's a nurse anesthetist in New York City. So he was responsible for uh, placing patients on ventilators with COVID-19. And a patient asked him, who's going to pay for it just before that patient was intubated and placed on a ventilator. And so Derek Smith tweeted, the last words I'll never forget, the response that my patient gasped out between labored breaths to me and my team, Africa, we explained that he needed to be intubated and placed on a ventilator. He's worried about who's going to pay for it. And Derek stated, this situation is by far the worst thing I've witnessed in my collective 12 years of critical care and anesthesia. Next level heartbreak is having to hear a dying patient use his last words to worry about healthcare finances. He said, this country is truly a failed state and it is so sickening to, work, to witness firsthand more blatantly than ever. And how has the free market worked out for healthcare providers? Well, ProPublica talked about emergency room doctors having their benefits and pay cut from two private equity uh, controlled companies, Team Health and Envision, who uh, contract with emergency room doctors, um, while these companies are spending millions on ads meant to pressure politicians who are working on legislation to stop surprise billing. And a physician who had a pay cut from those companies stated they've always been more worried about the bottom line. Physicians don't feel like they're being heard and respected for what they do, but we still show up and take care of patients. It's part of what is breaking the system down. This is the advertisement for that campaign, which is really um, deceptive and cynical. It's called Doctor Patient Unity. And these companies are saying, Congress, we need to provide doctors with the resources to continue saving lives. So they're using doctors uh, for their scheme of continuing surprise medical bill, billing as a, as a result of the network system we have for insurance companies in this country. Neil Irwin wrote in the New York Times, crises have a way of bringing to the four issues that are easy to ignore in good times. What do we need to better address a pandemic? Well, we need to improve funding for public health infrastructure, which has been cut 
uh, since 2002. We spend only 2.4% of healthcare spending on public health compared to 6% for Canada. We've lost 50,000 frontline state and local healthcare employees since 2008, which was a 20% reduction in those folks that work to control an epidemic. And there are 700 CDC positions that are unfilled currently, um, largely because of a hiring freeze that started at the beginning of the Trump administration. We need to have a cohesive, coordinated national system that predicts what is gonna happen with a pandemic rather than reacting too late to a public health crisis. We need to have adequate numbers of testing kits. We need to have adequate supplies of personal protective equipment. We shouldn't have a situation where the governor of Illinois had to charter two secret flights from, from China to uh, ship in personal protective equipment to his state, fearing that if these flights were known that the federal government would seize the personal protective equipment that he was receiving from China. We need to have adequate numbers of ventilators and we have to have adequate numbers of staff and be able to direct those staff to where um, the hot spots are occurring. And we've also seen problems with our national stockpile where there's been a fight uh, as to who should have items in the national stockpile. And we were told that they belong to the federal government and not to be shared with the state government and, and it shouldn't be like this with states competing with one another and the federal government. We need to have a strategic allocation of resources, directing resources where they're needed. Uh, we've seen rural hospitals close and we've seen a large inner city hospital, uh, Hahnemann Hospital in Center City, Philadelphia close. The patients in these rural areas and in center cities still need a hospital. It's not like their needs for hospitalization have suddenly gone away. But under our current system, hospitals are built and maintained where the most profit can, can be extracted rather than where patient needs are. We also have a specialty excess, uh, an excess of specialists like orthopods and cardiologists and a shortage of primary care providers and mental health providers. We need to have a global budget like for hospitals like police and fire. And we need to eliminate administrative waste Duke University has 1,600 billing clerks for their hospital system, which has 957 beds, so almost twice as many billing clerks as beds. We need to design redundancy into our medical facilities so that space can be quickly converted into hospital space. And we also have to have an adequate number of supplies, just like we do for a wartime emergency. We have adequate planes and boats and weapons of war in this country but we don't use them all the time, but we have them readily available. We need to take the same approach for preparation for a healthcare crisis. Sonia Renee Taylor wrote, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends, we are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. This is a time of upheaval when we need to look at what's wrong uh, with our healthcare system in this country and do better. Medicare for All would provide all of the services that you see in these boxes here, comprehensive coverage, preventative services, hospital care, physician services, dental care, mental health services, medication expenses, including negotiation of drug prices, reproductive health services, PT, OT, home care, nursing home care, long-term care, all medically necessary services without deductibles or co-pays. I'd like you to focus on the uh, two columns closest to the left. Currently, key issues is that we have health costs that deter people from seeking testing and treatment, but under Medicare for All, everybody um, could have medically necessary care without premiums, co-pays, or deductibles. Patients would get the care that when they need it without worrying about costs. We have a situation where mass layoffs force millions of Americans off their workplace health insurance. As I stated, over 38 million people have lost their jobs over the last nine weeks, and many of these people have lost their health care. Under a Medicare for All system, there is a seamless lifelong coverage that's not tied to employment, and Americans would enjoy the freedom and security of comprehensive coverage no matter what happens in the economy. Currently, we have under-resourced hospitals that face a surge of patients with, from a pandemic with costly critical health needs. But under Medicare for All, we could redirect $600 billion that's currently spent 
on administrative waste with our complex commercial for-profit insurance system, and we could direct that money to actual patient care and public health. Hospitals would be funded through annual global operating budgets, which could be increased during times of emergencies. And public health authorities could move supplies and people um, to where the needs are. Currently, we have public health authorities who don't have accurate data to make timely informed decisions because we don't have a unified electronic medical record. That would be provided for, uh, for medic in a system of Medicare for All where officials get real-time data from every hospital and clinic in the nation and empower leaders to make quick policy decisions and direct personnel and equipment where it is needed. So what can you do um, to improve our healthcare system and better our response to future pandemics? I'd like you to focus on item number four listed. There's an excellent video called fixithealthcare.com. It's free, it's about 55 minutes, and it's given by a businessman uh, on how our healthcare system affects his ability to pro provide um, health insurance for his employees. It's just the best single resource I can recommend to people. Fixithealthcare.com, free streaming. You can join pnhp.org, um, go to pnhp.org to join the organization and there's a wealth of information at that site. It's just an excellent resource. A very good book is The Healing of America written by a journalist T.R. Reed, who traveled the world and experienced the healthcare systems of other countries and compared them to the United States. And um, item number five, uh, we need to discuss the urgent need to restructure healthcare with our family, friends, and neighbors. Major societal changes are needed now uh, on a scale like those that were enacted during the Great Depression, such as Social Security and the New Deal. Consider hosting a um, house party, uh, watching the Fix It video, and then discussing that video with friends and neighbors afterward. Here's some important action that you can take, and uh, others will give details about this, but there is current legislation being proposed. It's called the Health Care Emergency Guarantee Act. This is very important. Sanders, Senator Sanders and Representative Jayapal have a bill, the Health Care Emergency Guarantee Act, that would provide um, medically necessary services to all those people who have lost their health insurance and it would include prescription drugs. And it would also cover people's out-of-pocket expenses, people that have insurance, but they still have out-of-pocket expenses. It's very important that our senators and our representative be asked to pass this legislation. You simply just call this number, ask to be connected to your two senators and your representative, and urge your senators and representative to support and co-sponsor this legislation. I have done this, it took me less than 10 minutes to make those three phone calls. And while you're at it, ask your senators and representative to co-sponsor HR 1384, which is the Medicare for All Act of 2019. You can write a letter to the editor, an op-ed, and you can go to use PNHP social media uh, toolkit. Finally, um, vote. It's very important to vote know who's really on your side and campaign for single payer candidates. So at this point, I've talked long enough and I can open it up to questions, but let me just end by stating one thing, uh, one statement, and that is, what have we learned from this COVID-19 pandemic? Well, we've learned that we are all human beings, that we are vulnerable to illness and death. We've learned that we are an interconnected web of humanity and they were, that we are all worthy. We need to hold healthcare as a human right. And to say that some people are deserving and others are not is a statement of selfishness and a statement of greed. We all truly can do better when we all do better. Thank you for allowing me to, allowing me to give this presentation and I'm Happy to take questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Engelhardt. That was incredible. Um, we have a few questions that some were submitted uh, right before the start. And so we'll start with a question from Sonia. And uh, she wants to know, are homemade fabric masks just as effective as the N95 mask? 
they're not just as effective um, as an N95 mask, but um, they're still recommended uh, to use. In fact, my wife <laughs> loves making masks downstairs on her sewing machine and she's uh, made several. They do provide a barrier, um, you know, from those droplets being spread from you to someone else. Um, and and there, the CDC actually advises that we wear um, masks, even if they're homemade masks like that, um, when we go to uh, public places. Um, so like if you go to the grocery store, um, other public places where it's necessary to go, it, it is a good idea to, to wear the mask. And the main purpose of the mask is uh, if you're infected and maybe even asymptomatically infected, if you wear that mask, you're protecting other people uh, from getting infected. So the, the, they're not as effective, but they're still recommended um, and I would encourage it. And that's what I do when I go to the grocery store. I wear one of the homemade fabric masks that uh, my wife has made. Great, thank you. And she has a follow-up which says, uh, she asks, it's been confusing, Trump claiming that anyone who wants to take a test can do so. But I've also heard, not from Trump, only those feeling the symptoms should be tested. So which, which is it? Well, um, initially the testing was for only those having symptoms. We have improved upon the availability of test kits in this country, but we still do not have the number of test kits we've heard, uh, I mean, that we need. I've heard that um, according to the uh, Harvard University Global Health uh, Initiative, that we need to be able to test 900,000 people in this country daily. And really, we only have the ability to test 300,000 people daily. Um, that number of 300,000 probably has improved some, but um, we have never been in a position, um, unlike what Trump has said, we have never really been in a position to have the testing kits we need and to be able to do the tests that we need to accomplish. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question uh, from uh, Christian Ramdor. Once Medicare for All is implemented, how will the Medicare for All help us better handle another pandemic? Well, I'm, I'm glad that that question was, was uh, asked. There's, uh, the bill is HR 1384, and actually you can read the entire bill if you go to pnhp.org and scroll down and you'll get a copy of the actual bill. And uh, I think the most, one of the most important parts of that uh, bill is called um, Title VI. And Title VI talks about budget. And there's actually only eight budget lines um, under Title VI. And um, the seventh budget line creates a special budget to allow the United States to be able to uh, manage an epidemic, a pandemic, uh, or other natural um, or natural disaster, or any other medical crisis. So it's built right into the legislation that we have a budget line every year uh, that provides funding for an epidemic pandemic, natural disaster, or any other healthcare emergency, and that budget is reviewed annually and can be increased if there is a need to um, increase the budget like we'd have to do now, we'd have to direct more funding. Um, so it, it actually takes that into account in the actual legislation, H.R. 1384. Thank you. So uh, I have a question here asking, uh, hang on one second. Uh, to what extent do you agree with Governor Lamont that Connecticut has met reasonable goals for having adequate PPE, beds, ventilators, testing, contact tracing, and isolation? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know the particulars about Connecticut's response. Um, I, I'm just not in a very good position to answer that. I just don't have the information I would need to give an informed uh, answer to that question. Um, maybe some from the Medicare for All Connecticut group could better address that, but I, I don't know the particulars about uh, Connecticut, so I'm sorry I'm unable to answer that question for you. Okay. Um, I have a question. Should the homemade mask have a filter? Well, um, 
I don't think it's absolutely necessary to have a filter. If you have, you know, fabric that's like two layers, uh, that, you know, gives you a barrier um, where if you would happen to cough or sneeze, it, it, it still is a barrier uh, to preventing all of those droplets like you saw in that slide I, I, I projected. Uh, it, it would prevent uh, a great portion of those droplets from being spread. So I don't think a filter is necessary, just a, um, a cloth um, and maybe a couple layers in that cloth. Um, so for example, the mask that we use, uh, that my, my wife uh, makes, um, it has a couple layers of fabric and it's kind of designed uh, with two straps, you know, one to go over your ears and one around the neck. And I, I you know, those two layers, I think, uh, do help block uh, a lot of the droplets from being just spewed out um, into the air. So I don't think it's really necessary to, to have a filter in there. Okay, thank you. Um, so Rana poses a question. Many lawmakers seem sympathetic to the need for reform of our healthcare system, but consider a not-for-profit, sorry, not-for-profit single-payer plan to unrealistic a goal. So what talking points have you found to be effective in countering this argument? Well, we've um, had a system in place for the, about the last 50 years that has been demonstrated to be ineffective in addressing the healthcare needs of our nation. Um, we have about 30 million people uh, in our country with no insurance. Now that's actually increased as a result of this pandemic and people losing their jobs. Um, and we have a number of people who have insurance, but it's, it's frankly, it's lousy insurance. So they're considered underinsured because their insurance doesn't pay for, for much. So if you have a, a healthcare system that you wanna design that addresses the needs of the people in this country, uh, our current commercial for-profit system does not do that. Our health outcomes, I showed you the longevity outcome, our health outcomes for um, maternal uh, deaths, uh, infant mortality. Um, so many of our outcomes aren't as good as single-payer countries. And how do we get this done? Well, we have a, a, an uphill battle, to be honest with you, because there are very well-funded uh, groups, such as the commercial for-profit insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies, that are willing to spend millions of dollars on fighting uh, single-payer. But this will get done just like other things that get done in this country, and it takes work. Uh, we have to work for what we deserve, right? Uh, we, we go to our job, we work, and we get what we deserve. We get our, our pay, we get our benefits. Um, and the same thing applies to legislation. This won't happen unless the people in this country take action and, and say to their senators and their representative, we want Medicare for all. And public opinion is such that most people in this country actually do want uh, Medicare for all, according to polling that has been done. But we have to put the pressure on our legislators to get this done. And I think it can be done, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of action from people who deserve a better system that we have right now. And if anything in the last 50 years has been clearly demonstrated is that our current system is not working. People are paying ever-increasing premiums, paying ever-increasing deductibles and co-pays, and not getting the healthcare coverage and access to healthcare that they need. And our outcomes show that. Great, thank you. I have a question here from Justin. There was a discussion of COVID testing being fully covered by the federal government. Has this been realized to your knowledge? Well, I don't know the details on that. I saw a real, I quickly scanned something today. I think it was in the New York Times. Or, or no, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll direct people uh, to the PNHP uh, Minnesota Facebook page because our administrator posted something there, I think just today, where it was an example of a bill uh, for COVID-19 testing where the patient still had to pay, even though supposedly we have legislation from mid-March in this country saying that everybody who wants a COVID-19 test can get one and the government will pay for it. So I, I don't think it's happening, even though supposedly it's, it, it should happen. Um, so to get the details on that, um, I, would, I would direct people to the PNHP Minnesota Facebook page because our administrator just posted 
uh, something about that, I think, today with an actual bill uh, that patient received being, being shown on the page. Yeah, timely. Thank you. Um, I have a question. What is your opinion about states and state legislators taking action trying to implement a single payer program? Well, I think the best approach is to do this nationally. Um, we were able to accomplish our current Medicare to cover over 60 million people um, in, without computers um, in a matter of about 11 months. We were able to extend Medicare for people in about 11 months when Medicare uh, legislation passed in the 1960s. So I think an, a nationwide approach is better, especially during pandemics, because you know, let's just say the state of Connecticut has single payer, that's a great thing. But in a time of pandemic, it shouldn't just be the people in Connecticut that um, get their testing done without worrying about the bill, because you've got to worry about your neighboring states and people going across state borders. So if everybody in our country, um, which is, has COVID-19 in every 50 states, um, everyone in the 50 states, all the states should have citizens who can get tested without fear of financial repercussions. So I think it's a wonderful thing if a state can do this, it really helps the people in, their, in the state. But in times of a pandemic, when it's a, a nationwide problem, we need everybody to have the ability to get tested. We have a, a bill called the Minnesota Health Plan um, for Minnesota, and, and uh, it would be great if we passed it in Minnesota. It would be great for the people of the state, and maybe it could serve as, as an example for the rest of the country, perhaps. But uh, I, I think the nationwide approach um, is, is better. Um, just an interesting little sideline, um, uh, the Canadian healthcare system actually did start in a single province of Saskatchewan. You maybe um, already know that, but it started in Saskatchewan from one of the national heroes of Canada, uh, that hero being Tommy Douglas. And uh, the other provinces in Canada saw how good it was for the people of Saskatchewan, and they wanted to emulate it, and that's what led to uh, Canada adopting a healthcare system uh, for the whole country but it did start in a single province. So perhaps in the United States, it would start in a single state and the rest of the country would see it's a pretty good thing and, and uh, all the states would adopt it. Yeah. Uh, how, I have a question for you. How do we respond to people who say universal single payer health care will cost too much and that we can't afford it? Actually, um, it would save money or uh, cost about the same and cover everybody. So it would not cost more. Uh, first of all, there are, there's $600 billion um, that we spend every single year in the United States that doesn't pay for any health care at all. It's just the administrative waste that happens. So it's, it's, that $600 billion is for um, companies to work with a broker to find an acceptable uh, health insurance uh, plan for their employees. That $600 billion goes to the um, multi-million dollar salaries of executives of health insurance companies. I, I think most of them make at least $14 million a year. Um, that $600 billion that's spent on waste uh, has to do with all the people in the hospital that must interact and actually have kind of a nitpicking war with insurance companies uh, all those billing clerks in the hospital dealing with our complex uh, multi-payer commercial for-profit insurance company, it, it's just so many people dealing with the complexities of our current system. So you have to you know, employ those people. And then also in the clinics, same thing. And then on the insurance side, there are a number of people hired from the insurance companies whose job is to basically um, try to deny you care. Because keep in mind that the insurance company's main goal is to make a profit. Uh, they are uh, in it for the profit. And if you have a, a bill that they have to pay, they consider it to be a medical loss. So um, that $600 billion goes to a lot of different areas and doesn't contribute anything to getting healthcare. We could redirect that for one thing um, toward actual patient care we could cover everybody in this country for the same cost or even less. And also think about um, negotiated drug prices. Under Medicare Part D, we are prohibited as a nation 
from negotiating drug prices. So basically the drug companies can charge whatever they want. You know, they can say you have to pay this much for your insulin or your EpiPen. Um, I worked in the VA uh, for the last 10 years of my career and patients in the VA were able to get drug prices at a 40% discount because the VA is allowed to negotiate drug prices. Um, and um, I can talk more about it, but uh, the VA is the largest uh, healthcare system in the country and the veterans are able to get their drugs at a 40% reduction because of drug price negotiation. So negotiation of drug prices is another huge area where it would make it much more affordable to patients in the country. Those are just a couple of examples. Um, we, we're fortunate this summer to have six um, University of Minnesota interns working with us. And there have been a number of studies, I, I know there's like over 30 studies that uh, economic studies that have shown single payer um, would save or cost less um, if we went to that system. And I'm actually asking those interns to work on doing a meta analysis to get all those studies on like one or two pages, like a bibliography, and to provide a, a brief summary of those articles. So that's, that's something I'd like to see because um, that's the question that frequently comes up. How do we pay for it? And if we could just have all that information as a resource in one place, I think it would greatly help us um, provide people with the answers. Um, but our current system is, is so costly. We spend twice as much per capita as any other uh, developed country in the world and our outcomes are, are worse. So this current system is costing us much more than we need to spend actually and, and, we, and we don't get much for it actually. So um, I, I hope that was an answer to your question, but uh, if they think the current system is, is working, that's just not true. Thank you. I have a question from a colleague of mine who uh, has asked, um, when Bernie Sanders has described uh, 1384, he has described it as something where you don't have to change your provider. You could say with your provider. Uh, and my colleague has a, an LMHC license as opposed to a licensed independent uh, social worker uh, credential. And so some credentials under the current Medicare system are acceptable and reimbursed and others are not and my colleagues credential is not and the question is um, With the Medicare for all bill would uh, Would there have to be extra steps taken to ensure that those licensures would be acknowledged? Um, is that a state license that your your friend has your uh... um, so uh, private insurance might reimburse a licensed um, marriage and family therapist. Uh, that's a credential. And, uh, and they would also reimburse a clinical social worker license. But uh, Medicare does not reimburse um, licensed marriage and family therapists currently. Yeah, so the even the federal. So um, Medicare currently. Um, doesn't cover some things like a uh, dental and vision it mm -hmm. doesn't cover so the leg legislation we're talking about hr 1384 has actually improved medicare for all because it it, it broadens the amount of coverage that's there yes. and it's de and it's designed to have uh, to cover all medically necessary care mm -hmm. and to provide continuity of care so you can continue to see the providers you've been seeing so um, I don't know the exact answer to the type of um, care that your, your, your friend um, delivers, but um, I know Medicare expands benefits to all medically necessary care. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it seems like, uh, and then also expands mental health services. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that um, your, your friend is providing medically necessary care uh, for families and with the expansion of mental mental health coverage, I just can't say exactly 100% for certain, but it seems to me the improved Medicare for All Act of 2019 would cover services like that. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm just checking to see if there are any other questions. I know that there have been some helpful links posted in the chat. Um, So does anyone else have questions? Now would be the time to put them in. Okay, I've got one. Uh, some providers do not accept insurance as payment. Would this continue under Medicare for all? 
would, would not accept insurance? Yes. Well, um, under the Medicare for All Act of 2019, there, the private insurance companies that try to duplicate uh, services that Medicare uh, would provide, those medically necessary services, would not be allowed um, by private insurance companies. So there wouldn't be private insurance companies except to maybe provide uh, benefits that are beyond the medically necessary broad range of services that Medicare would provide. An example of this was, was uh, explained by T.R. Reed in his book when he went to Canada. And um, so maternity care and even uh, care after the mom leaves the hospital is provided by Canada, but um, the, the bedding situation in the hospital is not a private room for the mom. Um, and so in Canada, it might be like two moms in, in one room. And, but if you wanted to be in a private room, uh, you could have private insurance cover that private room for you in Canada because the Canadian healthcare system doesn't cover uh, private rooms in that particular situation. So that's just an example of where um, there wouldn't be private insurance uh, except for um, some things that are not considered to be the medically necessary broad range of services provided uh, under the Medicare for All Act of 2019. Thank you. So they, um, that's very helpful. There's another aspect of this question, which is um, if uh, Medicare for All was implemented, some providers currently don't even take insurance. They only take cash. So would that continue under Medicare for All? Well, um, I suppose they could try to arrange some sort of system where they would take cash, but um, I think most of the providers in this country would be involved in the Medicare uh, for all system. Uh, as I mentioned, um, private insurance companies would not be allowed. Um, and honestly, um, how, many, how many patients actually can pay for the care of uh, you know, their health care out of pocket? I mean, uh, if you needed hospitalization in the United States, uh, how many people can afford to pay for their entire hospitalization out of pocket? So I think, you know, most people would, would need something like Medicare for All to cover their bills. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Could I say one thing about um, the power of drug price negotiation? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, I worked at the VA, as I mentioned, for the last 10 years of my career. And because the VA is able to negotiate drug prices, um, there is a drug for uh, hepatitis C patients that can cure patients of hepatitis C. And it's called Harvoni. And there's some other um, related drugs uh, to treat hepatitis C. So because the VA is able to get a better price on Harvoni, which by the way, costs about $80,000 for a three month course of treatment, one pill a day over three months, that can cure the disease. Um, but because, because the VA is able to negotiate that cost down from $80,000 and reduce it by like 40%, um, at the Minneapolis VA, our, uh, the network that we belong to um, involves the states of um, North and South Dakota, Western Wisconsin, Iowa, Nebraska, as well as uh, Minnesota. We had a team that worked at the VA that contacted every veteran we knew of that had um, hepatitis C and offered them treatment if they were a candidate um, for it, you know, that they weren't expected to die within six months or something like that. Um, but we reached out to every veteran in our network and offered them curative treatment with Harvoni and related drugs for their hepatitis C. And I know of no other healthcare system in the country that uh, has reached out to all of their patients and offered them curative therapy uh, for hepatitis C with medicines like Harvoni. Um, it's just an example of the power of drug price negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. That is very powerful. Um, I have a question here. Would the VA, military, Indian Health Services, and other government programs be integrated into Medicare for All? The VA would um, remain as it, as it currently is, and so would the Indian Health Service. Um, but um, other programs like um, 
Medicaid. Um, Medicare as we know it now, which is not the improved version that we're advocating. Um, the S-CHIP program for children, uh, all of that would be wrapped into uh, Medicare for All. And all of the funding that's currently going for you know, Medicaid and S-CHIP and everything would in turn go to the Medicare for All funding. Um, so really the only things that would remain um, under a Medicare for All system would be the VA as it's currently funded and um, the Indian Health Service. Um, by the way, the, the VA, um, if it's properly funded and properly staffed, has been shown by medical literature to perform as well or, or better than the, than the public sector. Uh, but again, it's subject to uh, funding uh, by politicians, which is the reason why I personally believe that this Medicare for All system, um, the administration of it, I feel, uh, should be um, like the Federal Reserve, where, uh, say, a president couldn't get into it and, and mess it up. <laughs> um, it's not currently uh, in the legislation, but that's kind of how I feel a Medicare for All system should be, that it should be allowed to run um, in the interest of public health and not be subject to um, political pressures, which I've seen happen with the, with the VA, unfortunately. But... Um, I tell you, the VA is a very good system if it's adequately funded and staffed. It, it, it performs extremely well. And I think that's why they're leaving it alone. <laughs> right. If it ain't broke. That's yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. So are there other people who have questions they'd like to put into the chat? Question and answer boxes. So if there aren't any more questions, this might be a good time to turn it over to Diane. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am, uh, my name is Diane Bullock, and I'm with Medicare for All Connecticut. And I am just going to take you through a very brief um, call to action on social media targeting um, Connecticut's members of Congress um, to support the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act that Dr. Engelhart uh, touched on briefly. This is the, um, the bill that uh, Sanders introduced in the Senate, Jayapal introduced in the House, and it empowers Medicare to pay any and all medical bills um, throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, not just COVID related uh, care, but all care until a vaccine is available. And this is not, uh, this is not bold. This is really just common sense. Uh, it's a rational measure uh, to help stem the tide uh, of a public health crisis by ensuring, you know, no one in this country is delaying medical care because of cost. And um, if you remember, that was one of the lessons Dr. Engelhart um, mentioned that we can learn from other countries that have gotten over this successfully, um, is that they are, you know, these are single payer systems in other countries where you can just go to the doctor and have it paid for. So uh, under this bill, uh, you go to the doctor, the, they send the bill to Medicare, Medicare pays for it. Simple as that. And this bill, according to Data for Progress, uh, this bill has 73% support among uh, voters, uh, among all voters, including 58% of Republicans. I mean, this is incredibly popular. Now, what is absolutely scandalous is that not one of our Connecticut members of Congress uh, in the House or Senate is supporting this bill and we need them to, and they need to hear from us. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a couple of posts that I just posted on um, Facebook and Twitter that I'm gonna share with you guys, and hopefully you will uh, like and share them as well. But one thing I just wanted to touch on real quick is, you know, I'd really, uh, I'd like us to, in our messaging, I've been thinking about this, 
and our, our messaging on Medicare for All in general, I really want us to start flipping the narrative and reframing the debate, kind of going on the offensive now, because when the majority of the country wants legislation that we want, we're not the extremists, we're the mainstream. You know, we're the centrists. Um, it's the radical position that's opposed to what's popular. And that's where each of our members of Congress are standing right now. Uh, so I, I just want, I want us all to be thinking of ourselves as this, on this issue, we are the centrists. They are the extremists. And when our reps are saying no to Medicare for All or this Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act, they're saying, yeah, I'm okay with tens of thousands of, of people in this country dying every year from preventable disease and 500,000 people a year uh, going bankrupt from, from medical bills. So it's, you know, it's just an absolute scandal. Um, they need to be put on uh, the defensive instead of us always being on the defensive about this. So I really, I just hope in general we can, we can reframe this. So anyway, now I'm going to just share my screen real quick. Okay, so this is the Facebook post I just posted. Um, and it's, I framed it in the, in the way that I was just talking about. When legislators oppose what the overwhelming majority of voters want, they are the extremists. The Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act, which empowers Medicare to pay our medical bills during COVID-19, enjoys 73% support among all voters. Yet not one of CT's members of Congress has co-sponsored this incredibly popular legislation. And so I tagged all of our members of Congress here, tell Senator Richard Blumenthal, Chris Murphy, Larson, Courtney, Deloro, Himes, uh, Johanna Hayes to stop being radicals and start standing with the people. So I'm going to paste this link into the chat. Wait a minute. Do I have to go back? Stefan, do I need to go? Oh, wait, can I just go into Q&A to paste the link? Stefan? Oh, more in there? No. Chat, 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 chat. There it is. Okay, so there's the Facebook post. If you just go in the chat, you'll see the post. And here is the Twitter post, the Twitter post. Um, on Twitter, a shorter character limit that you have. So I just got, you know, down to brass tacks about it. Um, and one, one thing that um, is just insane <laughs> is that so before the pandemic, 87 million people in the country were either uninsured or underinsured. And now um, we've got um, 27 million, I think, so far that have lost their health care. And I think we're staring down possibly 43 million uh, more Americans. And so that's well over a third of the population of this country um, not having adequate insurance or any insurance during a pandemic. I mean, come on. Um, and and a Congress of the, the CARES Act and these stimulus bills, nothing to address healthcare during a pandemic, you guys. I mean, come on, this is insane. So um what i did was i tagged our um our reps uh in the post here uh johanna hayes does not allow herself to be tagged in photos on twitter so i couldn't tag her but i tagged everybody else so i'm going to share this post with you on twitter there you go and for people who are not on twitter um here is a very handy guide on how to set up a Twitter account. Twitter is super, super important. Um, it's probably actually, uh, it's, a, it's a little more activist oriented, I think, than Facebook. There's, um, our, all of our reps are on Twitter. Their staff is looking at, the, uh, at their Twitter accounts all the time. And this is just such an amazing way to, to reach out to your member of Congress is on Twitter. Uh, Facebook too, but Twitter even more so. 
So you can tag them in a post and they will see it, trust me. Um, so please, please sh like and share those posts. Every time there's a like or a share, our member of Congress gets a notification about it. So it's super important. And the last thing I wanted to do was I wanted to share with you a petition that you can sign from PNHP asking our reps to, uh, to co-sponsor uh, the Emergency Guarantee Act, the uh, Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. So what they'll do is you just input your information here and PNHP will be able to send the petition directly to your member of Congress based on your zip code. So here goes my last link in the chat. That is the petition and that's all for me. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Pete Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Diane. So uh, stop I sharing my screen. Hold on, wait, 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 stop. Sure. Wait, 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 stop share. There it is. Okay, <laughs> <Great>. thank <laughs> thanks you. everybody. Uh, thank you, Diane. Um, yeah, my name is Pete Cunningham. I'm a uh, member of Medicare for All CT as well and the Central Connecticut Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I live in Hamden, Connecticut, where I've been helping to shepherd along a uh, municipal resolution um, in support of Medicare for All. For those of you who don't know, uh, municipal resolutions are locally passed um, at the municipal level, uh, obviously uh, non-binding, basically statements in support of Medicare for All. Um, so I have some links from the chat as well. Um, we've done a lot of work with Public Citizen, which is a national group that's sort of spearheading uh, this resolution idea in communities around the country. They've passed several. Um, one of the most recent ones was here in New London, uh, Connecticut, which was the first in the state to pass a resolution. And uh, like I said, I've been working with some other people to try to pass a resolution here in Hamden, Connecticut, which is in the third congressional district, um, Rosa DeLauro's district. She's been sort of a staunch holdout um, against supporting Medicare for all. So um, it's, it's really part of the backbone of her base. So we think that it'd be a, a good strategic town to uh, pass a resolution in. So uh, tomorrow night at seven o'clock, we're having a Zoom meeting to discuss the next steps for passing this resolution. Uh, where we are now is we have the resolution drafted. We have a petition um, circulating to, to build support and word of mouth. Um, and the resolution has been endorsed by the town democratic town council uh, committee rather. Um, and this is a heavily democratic town. So that's um, a pretty, pretty significant deal. Um, and right now, Hamden is like a lot of other towns is sort of in the middle of its budget season. So the town legislature is kind of tied up with that, but that's winding down. So once the legislature is kind of freed up to deal with other things, we're really gonna start hammering them about this, this resolution. Um, and I just dropped a link in for the uh, petition we have, which has the text of the resolution in it. So um, yeah, if anybody wants to jump on the call tomorrow, if you wanna help with the Hamden resolution, or if you want to learn more about uh, starting a resolution campaign in your town, we'd be happy to have you. Um, and just one more link that I'll drop in the chat is a um, op-ed uh, in our local paper that I uh, put together that should give you some more information about sort of the case that we're building at the local level for Medicare for All. Um, so that's pretty much all I have right now. Um, the information uh, about joining the call tomorrow is in the Facebook event. Um, uh, that's, that's it, yeah, we'd be happy to have anybody if they're interested. Thank you. Sure, who's up next? I think it's me. Um, I'm Rhonda Stuller, and I guess I'm the last person who's going to very briefly uh, wrap things up. I'm a member of Medicare for All Connecticut, and I live in New London, uh, where we recently, in February, I think, passed the first resolution uh, for you know, in support of Medicare for all. Uh, and I just want to say that this was a topic that resonated with everyone. Uh, the vote was unanimous. The budget watchdogs loved it. 
the citizens loved it, the city councilors who are struggling with their own health care and insurance issues loved it. Uh, it really appealed to everyone. So um, what I'd like to do, I'd really love to thank uh, Dr. Engelhardt for the presentation. It brought together for me a whole lot of issues that um, come together in a, a pretty profound way and, and perhaps gives us an opportunity to move forward. I want to thank uh, Stefan and Diane and Pete and Roseanne, uh, our panelists who kept things going. And um, I wanted to uh, just, I'll put in the chat the couple of um, links if people want to connect with Medicare for All Connecticut um, via Twitter or via Facebook, whether you are interested in working on town resolutions in call to action to really get our lawmakers on the right page uh, on public education. Um, it's, it would be great. Uh, there are many organizations and many individuals who are involved in this collaboration and you and yours uh, are welcome to be part of them. And uh, I wanted to mention also that um, there will be a follow-up email that goes out to everyone who participated in uh, some way in, in this program. So um, you'll hear more about possible follow-up actions. And if I haven't forgotten anyone, I think we can maybe end this like 10 minutes early and all enjoy your evening, be safe, be healthy, and keep on working on it. I don't know if there's a way to unmute everybody and give Dr. Engelhardt a round of applause. It was really excellent. Well, thank you for uh, having me give this presentation. It was an honor and a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.